So, thank you everyone for joining us today and, and a special welcome to our speakers. Um, we are one, we're still waiting for Maya Krishnan, who was due to be the first speaker, but um, let me just begin by introducing the um, panel, um, the, the, the background, background to the panel, which is something we convened four panels um, as part of the ESRC project that we are, um, several of us are engaged in called Gendered Violence and Urban Transformation in India and South Africa. Um, I'm the peer of the project and the, there are other co-eyes, Nandini Guptu, who is here, um, Sanjay Srivastav and Kamila Naidu and Lynn Osome in, who are working from Johannesburg. And the postdocs on our project are Garima and Shannon who are also here. And we're just really excited to engage with <laughs> scholars who are not in the project on similar themes and to hear about research that's being done. Um, we are. Our project is very keen to um, touch upon themes of everyday violence, um, the hidden forms of violence, and moving beyond methods that seek to count and categorize, but actually to interrogate the categories through which we understand gendered violence and through which discourses about gendered violence develop as well, which is themes that have been addressed in some of the papers today. Um, so without further ado, and knowing the time is really short, Unfortunately, Maya is not here. She was going to be the first speaker. And so I think we will just start with the second speaker, who is Sarada Chatterjee uh, at the University of Cambridge. Um, Sarada, would you um, uh, mind just telling people the title of your papers so that, uh, you know, it's coming better, that it's coming from you, but also just a reminder to everybody that um, the speakers will limit their remarks and because we don't have four speakers we can allow you maybe more like three minutes rather than the two minutes three four minutes max um, to uh, summarize the main points of your paper um, for the audience uh, you can start to type your questions in the chat and we will um, take them at the end after all the presentations um, I will offer a few points of discussion at the end but really just very brief ones so they can give the audience a chance to engage with your papers as well. So without further ado, um, Sarada Chatterjee, you're, you're, yeah, go ahead. Oh, you're muted, Sarada. Hello, everyone. My paper title is Migration, Genderless Violence and HIV Risk in Urban Areas. So I'm comparing the evidence from India and Africa. And so because I'll, I'll share my screen because uh, maybe it's slightly easier uh, to be faster. So we've all known that Africa shares the major bur burden of HIV and, and uh, yeah, India have also considerably struggled to bring down the infection rate. And, but uh, more important is 57% uh, of the HIV infection, people living with HIV in the whole world is women. And, and as we can see that in Africa, which is so, so, so prominent. And so when, while, uh, while uh, exploring the causes of this high infection rate among women, gender-based violence comes out as a very prominent uh, factor behind it. As uh, because it is globally, it is acknowledged that gender-based violence is one of the major, major, major reason that the high rate of violence, uh, high rate of HIV infection in India and Africa, and because research research shows that in Rwanda, Tanzania, South Africa, there is threefold increases the risk of HIV among women who have experienced violence than who haven't. And but migration further. And the direct consequence of gender-based violence is uh, are the phys physical causes, HIV, AIDS, and STIs. Um, but migration places uh, further risk and uh, further heightened risk on, on this woman. And if, um, if we think about the HIV uh, infection rate, the key populations, when it's added by the key population, sex workers, traffic women, um, and and there is this bridge population, which is the migrant and mobile population, and which and then the infection travels to the general population. But there is overlap because uh, among um, sex workers and traffic women, there are migrant and mobile populations. And if you think about India, the uh, the infection is very internal. That is, uh, the spread is more through the circular and seasonal migrants. Um, 
and 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 if you think about Africa, in, in addition to being internal, the Af women from Africa are also uh, getting uh, as a heightened risk of gender-based violence while transiting or at the destination. And uh, violence against women can happen at all stages uh, of migration and and committed by smugglers, traffickers, and intimate partners and and other migrants. And heightened risk are. are and undocumented migrants, refugees, asylum seekers. So I conducted a small, I, I conducted a study in Delhi, India on uh, HIV positive people. And, and the three, uh, there were in-depth interviews, including three men and three women. All the three men were migrant workers in the to the city. And uh, they, because of being alone in the city, they engage in high risk behavior and they begin HIV positive. And the other uh, three women, the first woman, um, because they experienced structural and domestic uh, violence in their, in their origin, and they traveled to the, and they migrated to the city, especially the first woman uh, migrated to the city to escape severe domestic violence by, by her husband. And, and both the women were uh, illiterate, unskilled, and at a city like Delhi, they couldn't find any better opportunity for, to sustain them, and they, they uh, took up sex work. And so the woman, I, when I was interviewing, she was saying it is like he, she tried to return to a village several times by her husband, sustained the uh, severe physical violence, and she couldn't return to a city. And the second woman migrated to the city of Delhi with, the, with her whole family and started working as a vegetable vendor with her husband, but the income was so little that she, she took up sex work. And both these women being, uh, being un uneducated and unaware, they'd had no knowledge of HIV and, and risk behavior and they became HIV positive. And the third woman was an innocent victim of her husband's uh, high risk behavior. The, her husband was a daily wage laborer and from, from, from his high risk behavior, she became HIV positive. Uh, I was looking at the, uh, my next <coughs> president, Minas, there is a word koshto. And I really uh, can highlight that koshto, the pain these women when uh, they, they, they narrated while being HIV positive, that how much they, they feared the pain. And also the pain was not only about HIV positive, the stigma associated with that. That Sorry, they, Sarah, I think you've you've reached the four minutes. So if you could just quickly wrap up, I know that we, up, yes. we can't go to the so, whole presentation. Yes, just, the yeah. trafficked women are at heightened risk of HIV, you know, because rape is a, a tool of initiation to sex for repeated rape, and um, detention camps are again rife with sexual exploitation and violence. So. Um, my, I, I, this is a multiple pathways which shows that HIV migration and um, migration gender by HIV, which is forced on direct is forced or coerced sex, violence, then uh, violence in childhood or adolescence, which is, uh, and that, that leads to high risk behavior. Then migrant women without appropriate livelihood opportunity in the cities, they engage in uh, transactional sex and then otherwise survival sex without much knowledge of HIV, then become HIV positive. And last one is the violence, the experience of stigma and discrimination being an HIV positive woman. Um, that okay, is the thanks, answer. sorry, we, we need to move on to the other because right. it's okay. People just have the, read your paper, yeah. There's the two questions I had for the panel, the how to bring out these narratives of migrant women, because given the fact they are very hidden and they, it's only de would depend on self-reporting behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sada. Okay, so I think this follows very well with Mirna's paper follows um, from that. And Mirna Guha is at the Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge. Um, so Mirna, do you want to just tell the title of your paper? And again, we, I'm keeping it really, I would say three minutes, just because we want time for the audience to engage as well. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Manali, if it's okay, uh, would you like me to share the presentation or is it all right if I don't? I think it's fine if you talk because we're assuming everybody's read read your paper. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Anali. So my paper is titled "Decriminalization as Anti-Violence: Insights from the Life Stories of Women in Sex Work in India." Um, and I think the format for today makes a lot of sense um, for me because these are quite early ideas that I'm putting together, and I'm hoping to think through them and get some feedback on them. But essentially, my ideas today are located in the landscape of a kind of radical democratic imaginary 
uh, following the work of Maggie O'Neill and Sheil, uh, which imagine a, a world in which sex workers have full human rights and they are uh, full civic citizens um, and they have they're given respect in that in that um, sense. Um, and uh, you know these authors they argue that opening up new and more democratic ways of being and becoming are dependent upon imagination, imaginaries, and hope for the future. And you know, as Doris Murphy in her paper on walking, talking, imagining ethical engagements with sex workers puts it, to move towards a better future, we must first imagine it. So my very preliminary ideas today um, essentially imagines a position through which we can maybe try to intervene in what often seems like a very impenetrable, polarized terrain of discussion about sex workers and life, not just in India, but globally as well. And particularly, you know, this polarized terrain on one side, you have the kind of overwhelming all sex workers violence uh, kind of uh, notion, which is put forward by radical feminists. Uh, it's taken up by the anti-trafficking discourse in a huge way in India. And of course, on the other side, you have the sex workers' rights movement, which is talking about sex work as work. Um, and you know, th these two positions seem to be at loggerheads with each other, and it's impossible to kind of try and bring anyone together to talk about a third position. So in a way, this imaginary uh, that I'm presenting today assumes a third position and su suggests a third position in which we recognize that there are structural oppressions that drive women into selling sex, uh, and that these structural oppressions exist even after these women enter sex work. But at the same time, we uh, do not inflict on them the epistemic injustice of not knowing what constitutes violence in their lives. And you know, going back to something Manali said earlier, where we are not seeking to categorize what is the most important and the most extraordinary form of violence in their lives. You know, there's enough literature on women's experiences that talks about how uh, within sex work violence by police is such an overwhelming but also ordinary form of cultural, you know, pain in their lives. But then when we are looking at the interventions that address violence in sex work, it's always looking at violence when it comes to their entry into sex work, so around trafficking. Uh, so this, this third position I'm imagining allows, you know, sex workers to be recognized uh, in their capacity as knowers of what constitutes violence in their lives, but also how to address it. Uh, but at the same time, it problematizes work within the sex work is work uh, slogan, and in particular recognizes the classes, classes, uh, castes, classes, and gender um, dimensions of work, and the ways in which when marginalized women in India take on work, it lends a certain um, sense of promiscuity to their identity, whether they are not, whether or not they're engaged in sex work or not. And the way I'm trying to do this is to imagine and reframe decriminalization as anti-violence. And um, I've done this through an analysis of some of the life stories that emerged from my research, and I'm not going to be able to go into it during my talk right now, but I'm very happy to answer questions around it. But what these case studies show was that within the social relations that constituted women's lives and sex work within a very prominent red light area in Eastern India, uh, patriarchal control and violence over their lives were authorized by the state um, through the lens and the prism of criminalization of sex work. Uh, so whether that was families not knowing that they were doing sex work, but still the police handling them over after kind of rescues. And then these women experiencing horrific violence at the police station from the patriarchs and their families, um, or about women in the red light area who were engaged in sex work for the various economic benefits, but were having their children taken away from them by their families because they were deemed to be not good enough mothers. And because of the laws around criminalization of sex work, they were not able to access legal support because the moment they would go to lawyers to ask, um, you know, if, if I can get custody of my child, they were told, well, you know, you're, you're a sex worker, so therefore you you are you are illegal in, in a sense, and therefore you cannot uh, avail of legal assistance. So, what I'm arguing, therefore, is in this scenario where um, sex workers are kind of caught in this constant negotiation of what is violence, what isn't violence, and what they are saying is violence and posture is not being taken into consideration. Decriminalization would allow for a loosening of these kind of patriarchal um, forms of control within their lives and therefore would loosen some of this everyday violence that they experience, not only for women who sell sex, but also for marginalized women who enter the informal labor market. Um, so, you know, a lot of the women that I spoke to when they had entered sex work was because there had been an assumption that they were doing sex work anyway, when they were a domestic worker and they were working in, in middle class households in cities in India, they had experienced abuse at the hand of the employers. And the assumption was always that, well, you are a woman on your own and you're in the cities, of course, you must be sexually available. And that had kind of driven them into sex work because the understanding was that if that is already the assumption for me, why should I not enter sex work and take on and, you know, avail of the economic benefits? So in a way, I'm arguing that decriminalization would loosen some of this um, 
stigma and some of this control over women's lives when it comes to taking on precarious work. Um, and it would allow them a certain amount of resource and agency to be able to deal with the law, to be able to get from the law, not just through collectives, but individually as well, which a lot of the women that I met in the red light area wanted to do, but were not able to do. But at the same time, I think I'm also not trying to suggest that decriminalization is an is a solution to end violence in the lives of women who sell sex, but rather can become a kind of starting point for talking about how can we positively intervene to address violence in the lives of marginalized women. And of course, I'm drawing on the work of Lindsay Armstrong in New Zealand, where she talks about decrim as a starting point. So the possibilities, you know, imagining the possibilities that decriminalization would open up to allow us to recognize sex workers as knowers uh, of the violence that they experience is essentially the idea that I'm presenting today. Thanks, Mirna. <laughs> okay, that's a little bit. Thank you very much. I think that was a good summary. Very good. Um, and so let's move on to Janice Lazarus, who is at Birkbeck, um, but currently in Belgium, I think. And very sunny environment. So um, Janice, if you'd like to introduce your paper and I'll give you three minutes as well. Thank, Thank you, Manali. Yeah, so uh, my paper is a part of my PhD research uh, and it's titled Unmarried Women's Everyday Negotiations While Seeking Abortion Care in Urban India. Um, to give a background, I interviewed 45 women who had had abortions in India while they were unmarried and they were from different urban cities in India. Uh, the whole, the background to this context is that sex, traditional patriarchal culture in India stigmatizes sex out of marriage and considers it to be taboo. Uh, however, the younger generation does not always do this and they are increasingly ex ex expressing their sexual choice and agency and engaging in sex. However, they did talk about uh, sex being okay, but having an unintended pregnancy or getting pregnant out of a marriage as being something that was not um, good or, you know, that, and they often call themselves stupid for having ended up with an unintended pregnancy. Um, and what young women did is that uh, because they were aware of the situation um, and the dominant cultural ideas that um, stigmatizes, stigmatized sex uh, pregnancy as well as an out of marriage abortion, they learned to very quickly compartmentalize their lives into two sides. Uh, one space within which they were open about their sexual choices and their rights, and this was mostly with peers, friends, you know, in some cases, siblings, uh, but they hid it from spaces where they would, uh, they imagined they would face backlash. And this would include like formal institutions, medical spaces, so they would not access a, a gynecologist because they assumed they would, um, um, they, would ex they would be stigmatized by this gynecologist or even uh, their families or older generations, communities. So they kind of compartmentalize their lives about their sexual lives is what I would say. Um, and, however, when they did uh, get pregnant and in most cases, this was an unintentional pregnancy, uh, they were aware that the medical system had, had not yet caught up with the changes in the value systems of the younger generation. And they were aware that accessing abortion care uh, would not uh, always be easy and accessible because the system as it is holds up the traditional values that stigmatize out of marriage sex. Uh, therefore, when women did get pregnant, they experienced a collapse of these boundaries that they had created. And um, in many cases did actually experience violence from providers or even their families and partners uh, when they uh, when they did want to get an uh, get abortion care, um, but as women did expect to experience backlash while seeking abortion care, they employed several strategies in uh, to negotiate and minimize this kind of stigma, such as they would lie about their marital status and they would just take their partners along and say that okay we're we're married and we don't want to have a child right now, or <clears throat> they would lie about their age or uh, they would uh, select, like choose a provider based on uh, 
either word of mouth or using an online crowdsourced list of gynecologists uh, who are uh, sensitive to unmarried women. And uh, so they, or they would choose a place which was not close to their uh, place of residence or workplace. Uh, they would either go up market or down market. So if they usually accessed uh, uh, other healthcare from larger private hospitals, they chose to go to like a small clinic to get an abortion. Whereas if they usually went to other hospitals, they chose to go to a more expensive private hospital so as to get confidential, uh, discreet, uh, and in a way anonymous uh, abortion care. Um, in this whole process, Janice, your time is up. Just oh. very quickly, if you could just wrap up one yeah. in one sentence. Yeah. In, in the whole process, what I did see is that women created everyday negotiations to resist, uh, and this could be seen as a form of very conscious social action on their behalf. And it's uh, and and quoting Vintangen and Johansson, I say that it's something that is between public confrontations and hidden subversion. Uh, and it is something that is very different in the different contexts of women, and it is entangled in relations of everyday power. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much, Janice. Um, so uh, I'm just going to keep my comments very brief because I want to, to give the audience a chance also put, and if you can want to start putting your questions in the chat, you can address them to individual speakers or in, in general. Um, so uh, just to, I just, you know, because one of the things that we're really struck by in, in the project itself is this whole question of how much the discourse around violence has, uh, around violence against women has sort of been, you know, so much a part of the discussion. It's been, it's been growing in, in, in um, there, there's a growing concern with this question of violence against women lot more laws that are being passed around that. And yet what we're finding is that uh, the violence continues unabated. So the question is really about sort of why is it that the, the growing concern on the part of the state or the non-state sector is, is not really kind of meeting where the needs around anti-violence movements are. And when I was look, looking at all the papers, and it's a shame Maya's not here because her paper really talks a lot about the ways in which uh, upper class elite uh, newspaper reporting in the Times of India actually creates an elite, has, a, has an effect on creating an elite sensibility around violence because of the selective and spectacular nature of the reporting around violence. And what the other papers are doing are actually talking about the kind of opposite side of that, which is the everyday um, and you know non-spectacular, but just the mundane and banal, but extreme in some cases forms of violence that go neglected, that in fact are exacerbated under certain conditions like forced migration and so forth. Um, and I just wondered whether all three papers could maybe benefit from really kind of bringing out that element of the violence. So what is, what is, what is it that you mean when you say every day, you know, is it, you know, is it, are you saying that it's so endemic and structural as not to be noticed or recorded? Is it that actually it is about a certain type of exclusion that um, these particular women experience? And is it is it then sort of a mirror opposite of the elite sensibility, which is saying there's, there's a growing concern about violence against women, but certain kinds of violence against women are okay, you know? So I just wondered whether all three papers might benefit from situating the specific cases in a more general discussion about these uh, forms of deflection and neglect and uh, you know hiding and subverting of uh, an, a better understanding of violence. Um, I don't expect a reply. <laughs> um, in fact, I, I wonder whether we should take um, some questions and then maybe you can come back to sharing your thoughts on, on this point I've made. So there's one question from Sarada, a panelist. Oh, hang on, sorry, it's gone down here. Um, Sarda, I'll read, I'm happy to read them out. Given that a large number of women enter the sex industry in India through trafficking, will not decriminalizing sex give a protection to the traffickers? Um, and I think there's another question from Mirna, which Mirna, do you want to just, it's very long, I'm not going to read yeah. it, it's from Nandini. <laughs> can, I, <laughs> yeah. can I answer Sarda's question? Yes, of course, course, of course. Or should I respond to both together? Just go ahead and um, re respond to Sharda, and then you can read Nandini's question too after that. 
Oh, you're frozen. Oh. Oh, she's reading the question. Okay. Sorry, I'm just reading through the, the question. My internet's a bit wonky. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think two really, really interesting questions. Thank you for the questions. I think Sharada, the first thing that I would say is that, you know, having worked in the kind of anti-trafficking sector before I kind of moved into doing this research with women's lives uh, or, or around women's lives, um, in, not just in sex work, but women who kind of sell sex and their lives after as well. Um, I think what I'm trying to do is heterogenize um, the, the, the category of the trafficker, you know, who is the trafficker? Um, and in this context, why are women relying on the trafficker? Uh, what is the trafficker offering them in this context? Uh, and in the context of my research, what I found was that women often relied on um, usually acquaintances, male acquaintances in their village uh, to escape um, kind of everyday violence within their families. And this was, you know, just coming back to Manali's point, and these were, when I'm talking about everyday violence, I'm talking about violence embedded in everyday social relationships. And um, these were violence that they experienced within their families. It, this was violence that they experienced within their marriages. And they just sought a way out of their community. And of course, these are women who, with very low technical skills, low education skills, and they relied on, um, you know, people in their community to just give them any work, or as I, uh, as I say, you know, phono card. Uh, so just get me out of here, give me any work. Um, and then, of course, this kind of reliance and vulnerability led them to being coerced into sex work. Um, often they did not want to enter sex work, but this is, this is what ended up happening. And what I'm suggesting is that if we decriminalize sex work, then we perhaps can also open up the possibility of funding safe migration and safe work routes for these women who want to leave their community and who want to travel to cities to work. Instead of pouring all our money into trying to get women out of red light areas and sending them back to their families and homes, uh, which in the anti-trafficking hypothesis is seen as somehow being oppositional to the trafficker, but, but we don't really map the continuity between the family and the trafficker and how the trafficker feeds off a system that starts from the home. Uh, and isn't somebody existing in isolation who's just there to prey on somebody, jump out of a bush and prey on someone. Um, so in a, in a sense, I would say that decriminalization weakens uh, traffickers because it weakens the power that they have over these women. A lot of the women who were coerced into sex work were also blackmailed by their traffickers and they were told that, you know, if you, if you leave sex work, I will go back to your family and tell them that you have been in this red light area. So this power is only given to them because of the criminalization around sex work and because of the vulnerability that these women have and the fear that they have that, you know, of the stigma and all of that. So what I'm suggesting is um, that decriminalization would open up a lot of possibilities around programmatic interventions that are a more holistic way of addressing violence in their lives and vulnerability, rather than just focusing in on the image of the trafficker as the only perpetrator of violence. Does that make sense? Right. Um, uh, Professor Gupta, thank you for your question. This is really fascinating. Um, you know, what was really interesting, and I'm hoping to write a paper about this, was that I did notice a generational divide among the women that I worked with. And the women that I uh, spoke to primarily uh, were women who were upwards of age 18 to, I think, about 36. And most of them fell into this category of like self, of course, you know, there was no kind of age verification, all that, but they self-identified as being between 18 to 25, 26 years of age. And there was a lack of awareness, I would say, about the collectivizing efforts of Durbar, um, particularly, but there was definitely the sense that membership to the sex workers collective would bring with it certain conditions. Um, and an example of this was one of the, and coming back to kind of Sharada's point about HIV, one of the women I spoke to, she said, um, you know, if I become a member of a grassroots collective and, and not specifically Tuba, but any kind of grassroots sex workers collective, all they want is my blood. By which she meant is all they want is for me to go to the health clinic and for them to test me for HIV vulnerability. And there was this sense that any other form of violence that is not directly connected somehow to vulnerability to, to HIV AIDS and sexual diseases will be overlooked by sex workers collectives. And I don't know if it's because of the funding constraints around the time that I was doing my field work, um, but 
there were also incidences of police violence. For example, one of the case studies that forms part of the paper that I want to write about um, was this case study of a brothel raid and a lot of kind of horrific, but also everyday violence that took place where this woman was taken away because the madam wasn't there and the woman was held hostage by the police. And the police said, well, if the madam does not hand herself over, we will keep this woman who was employed by the madam as a sex worker, we will keep her hostage. So all these kinds of very deceptive kind of violence that's taking place. And it was not really addressed by the sex workers collective at that point, because there was there was either funding issues or there were issues around disrupting community norms and relationships with the police. Um, so there was definitely a kind of generational divide about who is looking out for whom and what benefits are available for sex workers if they become part of collectives and participate in collective activism versus looking out for oneself. And maybe we can, you know, this can lead to a conversation around neoliberal ideas around kind of protest and revolution, all of that. But there was definitely this divide within the field. Um, I, I hope that answers your question, but I'm happy to kind of talk about this more. Oh, great. Thank you. And Nandini has followed up with a, yeah. with a comment. Um, there is a question for Janice. Uh, I don't know if you've been able to read it. Uh, I'm, just, I'm reading it if you okay. can. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you, Shannon. Um, uh, so I think uh, to answer your question, um, <clears throat> uh, yes, it's, um, I would take it back to like the social underpinning or the social culture uh, within which uh, abortion care systems are set up or even the legal law, like the laws and the legal systems are set up. And, um, I uh, feel that uh, in order to critique this, we need to, in a way, go back to the diversity of women's experiences and not just look at like the at, at the bodies of married women as the norm of people who are seeking abortion care, but look more at like teenagers, trans people, unmarried people, uh, and just look at the diversity of people who uh, need abortion care. Uh, and I think we need, I've not written this in my paper, but when you ask this question, this is what I really think about. I think we need to fall back on the concept of reproductive justice, which was developed by Loretta Ross and her colleagues uh, in the United States, uh, talking about reproductive justice, not just being about, uh, you know, deciding if you want to have children and when you want to have children, but also looking at the context within which you want to raise these children and bringing in the Inter, uh, intersectional issues of such as migration, labor, uh, immigration, you know, uh, even um, sex work for that matter and trafficking to see that what is it that we can do to uh, really destigmatize things and look at several systems and not just that the system that looks at abortion specifically in, um, you know, kind of addressing everyday stigma uh, and, you know, like broadening the dynamics within which stigma uh, creates, uh, stigma operates, sorry. Yeah, that's what I would say, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions or any comments from anyone on the panel um, that you'd like to raise? Any other last questions? I think we're at almost at the end. Um, of the... I'm just wondering, I mean, sorry, if I just wanted to have a, um, just have a think about Charles's question that she, you know, she mentioned at the end of her presentation, you know, how yeah. do we kind of, how do we talk to these women about these hidden experiences around HIV AIDS? And I wonder if it's um, possible to do it by not talking to them about HIV AIDS, but talking to them about other things. Um, I mean, I, I, I particularly found, um, and, and this is this is where I, I find problematic because I feel like there's a lot of literature that kind of challenges the anti-trafficking discourse that we haven't done enough to problematize the HIV AIDS health discourse in India and what that's, what that's done to the perception of sex workers as kind of vectors of disease and so on, especially around COVID, especially this kind of resurfaced. Um, but kind of 
I found that approaching sex workers through the prism of health concerns was not always very helpful. And that's one of the reasons why I kind of approached them by just asking them you know, about their lives. And I said, I just want to hear about your lives. And I'm not saying that's the solution, but I'm just saying that sometimes the health discourse I found could be quite alienating um, to kind of forming a relationship where they did not feel instrumentalized. And especially, you know, as I keep coming back to the statement where she said, you know, they just want my blood. Or she said, you know, this, this organization is like a mosquito, which is such a powerful, powerful image. Um, and I think maybe, maybe we need to rethink ways of how we engage with vulnerable communities that are at risk of health, but without the, the kind of rhetoric of, of health concerns. I don't know if this makes sense, but it's just something I'm kind of thinking through. I mean, I just want to say, I think also that this mirrors the disciplinary um, kind of pigeonholing of questions around violence into yeah. the health and uh, demography and, um, you know, criminology um, oriented disciplines, which actually lift off, lift up the problem and place them within certain parameters that don't allow us to actually ask questions about the everyday, which is why I wanted to return to that in the sense that questions around autonomy, agency, um, and, um, you know, negotiation, all these things that keep coming up in the papers, but aren't, you know, aren't, allowed, we can't ask them within the constraints of specific um, disciplines, I think, mm. as easily. Um, I think we have to close now because we, uh, yes, there's a closing plenary se session at one o'clock and, uh, and Nandini says, absolutely agree with Nali's comment. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we, we, we're, this is the, this is the close of the panel, I think. We have to go now. Is that right, Yumika? It's 12.30. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I just want to thank everybody for your fabulous papers and really, um, unfortunately, a shorter discussion, but really thank you for being part of the panel and um, uh, hopefully people that have had comments can quest, can send them to each of the speakers later on. And of course you can all engage with each other as well. Um, so that's wonderful. If you can start making some connections amongst yourselves. And yes, there's a plenary session at one o'clock and it was just a real pleasure to have you here and hopefully see you some, some other place soon. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.